Thank you uh, for that very uh, kind introduction and for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, so what I was going to do is uh, represent the work that's happened at, in our group at NIST over the last couple of years by a number of, of our members of our group that have contributed uh, to advancing the application of NMR methods uh, to assessing, um, as was, was mentioned by Andreas, uh, monoclonal antibodies, but biologics or protein drugs in general. Uh, this was a problem that came to us um, probably more than a decade ago now. Um, there was a real need, and I'll go through this in my talk, how we come about what kinds of problems we, we try to address at NIST, but there was a real uh, need that was brought to us by our many stakeholders in industry and the regulatory agencies of having more precise, accurate, and robust methods to assess structure of protein therapeutics and, and more complex therapeutics. And as I'll go through in my talk, um, the structure, particularly these higher, what's called these higher order structures, the foldedness of the protein, the you know, if it aggregates or not, these are really um, attributes of a protein therapeutic that are quite unique to these types of therapies um, and are not, we're not really something that had to be dealt with in the development of more traditional small molecules. So again, thank you for giving me the opportunity today to, to represent our group's work. And so let me start off again by just um, introducing, uh, I guess most of the folks on the phone now uh, or on the call have already heard from, uh, from folks from NIST, so you may know about us. Uh, but NIST is a uh, non-regulatory agency of the, of the US government. We're in the Department of Commerce. Um, and within NIST, we support um, sort of commerce development and uh, advancing uh, particularly manufacturing. And underneath our, uh, the way we develop programs we, is by working with stakeholders and, and again, getting feedback as to where we could actually develop measurement science standards, technologies that will accelerate uh, the development and manufacturing of advanced uh, products. In our case, under the biomanufacturing initiative as shown here, uh, the manufacturing of innovative, high quality biotherapeutics. And again, we do this at, as NIST as creating a community around us where we get feedback. We try to address, uh, because we're a relatively small organization compared to the large ecosystem of biopharma, uh, where are the, the large infrastructural problems, particularly measurement problems? So we try to get feedback to say, where what problem could we address at NIST that would have the broadest impact across the entire uh, ecosystem? And, and so we try to go after those. And um, then we also look at problems that we identify that we can actually solve in this that are truly measurement problems where we could bring our measurement expertise to bear and also our, our sort of strengths in developing standards and, and harmonization of methods. And we always strive to promote cross-industry collaboration and open sharing. So much of our work is at the pre-competitive stage where we're trying to sort of, again, raise all boats uh, with the work we do. So the particular focus of this talk and, and the series is monoclonal antibodies. And by again, quick introduction, uh, the monoclonal antibody is really the, 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 the king of biologics right now in terms of the platform molecule that's being most used to develop new advanced protein therapeutics. Uh, as shown on the left here is the sort of cartoon structure of an IgG uh, antibody uh, with its fab fragments uh, at the top shown here with blue and, and purple are the variable regions, which are where the amino acid sequence will change to hit various targets. And then there's the FC domain, which, which binds to, to immune cell receptors. So as, as a platform drug, this type of molecule could be readily uh, developed and repurposed for other targets and other diseases. It can hit conventional targets and it can also uh, uh, recruit the immune system so it's an immuno, these are immunotype therapies. And so you get that initial sort of natural benefit of using this type of platform molecule. They've been highly successful uh, in, in treating many forms of, of disease. And, and again, because of their rapid developability, these were some of the first therapeutics that came in response to things like the recent COVID pandemic. Uh, and again, we like to point out because we're part of commerce uh, that these are a large part or the, maybe the largest part of the what we call the bioeconomy. 
So the sales of these advanced therapeutics and now uh, complex uh, vaccines like the COVID vaccines really represent billions of dollars of sales every year. And, and so it's really not only a large health, uh, you know, health, public health uh, issue to develop these therapeutics, but it's certainly a large economic driver here too. Um, the other thing that uh, to point out, which came to us when we started to ask questions about where we could provide new measurements or uh, uh, address measurement gaps was that um, starting you know, in the in the early 2000s, it was recognized that a lot of the monoclonal antibody drugs that first came to the market as innovators would be falling off patents. And so the so-called patent cliff was, was seen coming, uh, particularly members of the regulatory agencies, the FDA, EMA, had to um, develop ways to approve uh, what would soon be coming, which were these so-called biosimilars, which were essentially analogous to the generic drugs that were developed for small molecules, but because biologic proteins were considered uh, a situation where they couldn't truly be copied identically, uh, they're considered biosimilar and not generic, but the idea was they needed measurements uh, for comparability to, to address what would be coming on sort of follow-on molecules and again, there's a large driver here in the market because you bring these follow-ons, you could potentially reduce costs to the, to, the, to the patients by having competition. And the basic idea is you're there and, and where our strengths at NIST come in because we're primarily developing measurements in physical and chemical uh, uh, analytical tools to look at proteins is uh, when you develop uh, a typical uh, innovator drug, uh, it's really driven largely by clinical trials, which are long and expensive. And the idea on a, on a biosimilar development pathway is the more you could learn about that molecule and sort of inverting the so-called inverted pyramid scheme as shown here, the more you learn about it analytically, the, the less, or you reduce the need potentially for the extensive and expensive clinical trials. So again, with the idea of bringing the biosimilars to market more quickly and at lower cost, um, a robust analytical foundation of your pyramid could actually help, could help do that. So um, with these protein therapeutics, uh, there's a lot of attributes of the therapies that have to be measured, revolving around essentially four areas, the potency of the molecule, how well does it work, its identity, the purity, and stability. And as I show on this slide, there's 20 to 30 release tests for monoclonal antibodies. There's lots of measurements that are done. And, and these are, again, because these are complex molecules, uh, there's lots of different techniques that come to bear to sort of get a robust characterization of the molecules to get confidence that you, that you understand and, and can confidently uh, describe each one of these areas. Um, and what I want to transition now to talk about for the rest of the talk is the area that we've focused on in all of those, which is the identity area of the molecule and primer, uh, and focus particularly on structure. So again, for most in, on this call, perhaps this is nothing new, but uh, proteins fold, okay? They're not like small molecule drugs. There's a primary sequence. These fold into secondary structures and those secondary structures fold into higher order tertiary folds and then quaternary structures. And in situations which are often unwanted, these proteins can also aggregate uh, because an, an aggregation event is something that's uh, considered quite serious because it can induce an immune a response. But this is really uh, one of the primary uh, unique features of these protein-based drugs. And in order to, to be able to, to understand the structure and measure it in sort of the in an analytical regulatory context where you can actually describe the structure with confidence, with a method of high precision that's robust, where you can actually detect changes that are meaningful, um, is really critical. So there was a need, as I said, about 10 years ago, it came to us looking for uh, new methods that could actually do this. Uh, and, and this is where we stepped in and said, perhaps uh, NMR could play a, a significant role here. And again, the measurement need is that we have to show that these molecules are folded, and that there is no changes to the fold or unintended aggregation uh, that would make it unsafe or ineffective. Um, so for those who are familiar with NMR, uh, NMR is a very, has a very straightforward way that has been established for many years of quote unquote fingerprinting 
proteins. Uh, anybody who's ever worked with protein biomolecular MR knows it. Uh, you can do uh, two-dimensional correlation spectroscopy. And in doing so, uh, here I show the example for one small protein uh, biologic. Uh, you can correlate the nitrogen uh, and proton of every amide in a, in, a pro, in a protein. And what you end up is what's showed on the lower, lower right um, is this two-dimensional spectra where the cross-peak patterns that you see there really represent the folded state of that structure. So there's a unique folded state pattern to those cross peaks. And each one of those represents a particular amino acid in the protein. And so what NMR really gives you is, is these uh, uh, highly sensitive localized reporters across the entire protein, in this case, the backbone of the protein, and the sum of all those reporters and the sensing of the chemical and structural environment of those proteins gives you a unique pattern that tells you that that's the folded, you know, the folded state of the protein at that time. And so um, if we wanted to consider using such a method as this for, for the application in pharmaceuticals, uh, we had to basically demonstrate that we could apply this method in a practical way, that it was general, it was very precise, but also robust and didn't drift and, and sensitive to changes. And the other thing that's important, and I sort of allude to it in this slide, is it has to be applied to uh, as provided materials. So oftentimes, or most oftentimes in basic research, NMR is applied with isotope enrichment of proteins, uh, which allows correlations uh, to, you know, putting the more NMR active nuclear like N15 or C13 into your protein uh, through ex uh, heterologous expression. But this is not really the case when you're dealing with pharmaceuticals. You basically have to measure what, what's in the vial. So that means for NMR, can we do these kinds of experiments at high, at, at natural abundance? So the other thing that we, we were facing, and so we could show early on that, that two-dimensional sort of classic nitrogen proton correlation mapping would work very well for small proteins. But the challenge, the physical challenge or physics challenge of NMR is as you go to larger and larger proteins, uh, your lines broaden because your tumbling slows down. So these molecules tumble more slowly in solution. The correlation time increases. The lines broaden. That's shown through a simulation here, which shows you from the small 19 kilodalton protein up to the monoclonal antibody, uh, how the line widths in, a, in this simulation would be expected to broaden. So you broaden your lines, you lower your sensitivity, you and you basically create uh, uh, spectra that are not as well resolved. And so really... What was most interesting uh, to, to the folks, again, because it was the most dominant platform molecule, was whether we could apply NMR to monoclonal antibodies. And so, um, so if we initially we, we made an attempt to look at N15 correlations at natural abundance of things like monoclonal antibodies. And I think you've already heard in an earlier talk from John Scheel about NISMAP. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is, is focused on applying methods to NISMAP, which is our publicly available standard, which allows us to do a lot of these benchmarking of any of these analytical techniques. But as you can see here, even if you're uh, not an NMR spectroscopist, the, the number of signals that, that you get from an antibody compared to a small protein goes up and the quality uh, really goes down, the lines get longer. And the time frame it takes to take these experiments in natural abundance was multiple days, which is really not practical. So um, if you can't get actionable information in a reasonable time, uh, folks in industry lose interest right, you know, very quickly in, in your method. So uh, at the time when we were initially starting and seeing the performance of the N15 correlated experiments, we decided to pivot uh, to attempt to use carbon-13 correlations. And this is something else that had been explored broadly in the field of biomolecular NMR. Uh, methyl groups are, are had been used to look at large protein systems. There's some uh, intrinsic advantages to using methyl correlation spectroscopy, uh, first of which is it's a slightly higher natural abundance, but more critically, the uh, methyl groups have this intrinsically favored relaxation because of their rotation uh, around the methyl bond. And so they can actually give um, sharper spectra than one might anticipate for other residues in such a large protein as an antibody. And the other thing, as I show here, it's in these um, sort of salmon spheres where all representing all the methyls. Uh, 
is like the amide correlations, the methyl correlations really do uh, represent or sample the, the uh, structural space throughout the entire protein. And so uh, in 2015, which is now almost eight years ago, we published the first paper to show that uh, we could indeed collect these two-dimensional carbon correlated spectra. This was work at the time that was done by Luke Arbogast, who's since moved on to uh, join Eli Lilly and Rob Brinson, uh, who's still with us. Uh, and they basically showed that, that indeed we could collect these C13 correlated spectra, similar to the way one would collect N15 spectra. Uh, we could actually, uh, because there were fewer methyls, we could actually see almost all the methyls we would expect uh, in a given spectra, and we could collect these these data in a reasonable time frame in a, in a course of a couple of hours rather than days. And we also did quite a bit of work to show that that the N15 and C13 methyls data sets, while orthogonal, seem to be sensing similar um, similar similar aspects of the protein structure in terms of representing the structure in the folded state and also sensing the differences. So we had a much more sensitive fingerprint we could use in methyls. And, and from then on, this is where we've been focusing our attention uh, on carbon correlation. And uh, you can collect fingerprints of the full MAB. Uh, antibodies can be fragmented into their FC and FAB uh, fragments that are shown here. This is FC and FAB fragments, and you can basically look at the cleave mixture, uh, the FC, or isolate either one of the two fragments and look at them individually. This will become important at the very end of the talk when we talk about uh, how we could put assignments on these spectra. So, uh, so far, these what I'll talk about is how we use these spectra first in, in a non-assigned mode, so just in the pattern, understanding the patterns, but uh, eventually, Again, with NMR, which is unique to this spectroscopy, we could potentially put labels on each one of these peaks that assigns them to specific correlations within amino acids in the protein. So uh, just to, to quickly highlight what we have to do when we develop these kind of approaches is, first of all, we want something that's broadly applicable. And uh, Eva Bond, who's a longtime collaborator of ours, who's also been uh, pioneering some of these uh, fingerprinting methods with NMR, was able to show that, that these carbon-13 as well as N15 correlations could be broadly applicable to any FDA-approved drug. He used about a half dozen or more uh, uh, pharmaceuticals they could get from the pharmacy. Uh, they have an easier time of it than we do because they're a regulatory agency and getting FDA-approved drugs to research. Uh, and they were able to show that, as we might expect, for, as an NMR uh, expert would expect, that these methods are general. Um, there was nothing special about the methods we developed for NISMAB, but it could be applied to basically any antibody uh, in the IgG class. And again, this is, this is a nice feature for us because we're developing methods, and because it's a class molecule, any method we develop on NISMAB, which is a representative of that class, we would hope, as we saw in this study from Eve, that it would be broadly applicable. Um, the other thing we need to show when we develop these methods uh, is that they're actually robust and they're reproducible. And so uh, Rob Brinson, again, led an intern lab study of, that NIST uh, uh, brought together groups from around the globe to basically show, you know, it's a, NIST does this quite a bit to ask the simple question if you give everybody the same sample and ask them to make the same measurement, can they do it? And does everybody get the same answer? And so it seems like a fairly simple mundane exercise. It's interesting when you actually go through these exercises, what you find and where the variance comes in. But this really helped to, uh, and this uh, all of this work was published with about 48 co-authors. And it basically, um, showed that the method, the NMR method was actually incredibly stable, incredibly precise in terms of the, the spectra that people could collect across different uh, NMRs at different field strengths from, I think, as low as 500 up to, to eight, 800 or 900 megahertz. Um, and that, that uh, by doing this type of exercise, we also could, um, could make uh, suggestions about best practices for harmonization of the method and to gain confidence and broader, more rapid adoption because everyone could see that, that and particularly 
uh, when there's a question of, you know, how well will the method work from one lab to the other between different sites? Um, is, it, is it something unique? Um, this would show that the community came to a consensus of how the method could be best applied. Uh, and that's basically the way NIST works, again, because we're, we are non-regulatory, so we work together with our community stakeholders to get adoption. So, <clears throat> so we were able to show that the method is broad and applicable. So the next, uh, what I want to just point out, too, is the one of the strengths of NMR is that NMR can do selective um, selective spectroscopy. So we can look at subsets in a complex mixture of signals. And in particular, all of these methods, uh, we'd like to be able to apply to as provided drug formulations. And in order to do that, we have to deal with these pesky things called excipients, which are put in there to stabilize the, the biologic. Um, these can be uh, uh, large, fairly high concentrated uh, things that are added to the drug formulation. With, with signals that are orders of magnitude larger than the protein signals that could potentially obscure our protein signals or which we're particularly interested in to fingerprint the protein. And so we, uh, here's just some examples of some typical excipients, sucrose, sodium acetate, methionine, polysorbate, and you can kind of see the artifact signals that come from each one of these spectra, particularly the sucrose. And this is our fingerprint region, and if those kind of things can really interfere with the ability to use the spectra um, and to actually particularly use them in statistical and, and PCA type analysis, which I'll point out. So uh, to address this, Luke Arbogast um, uh, took some work that he began as a graduate student when he was at Hopkins, uh, looking at selective um, excitation, two-dimensional selective excitation. Again, I just show the pulse sequence, but it's not really important to go into detail. But the idea is one could actually use it in a two-dimensional spectra, selective pulses to basically um, either subtract away or excite certain regions of the spectra. And uh, what Luke was able to show was that by using these types of two-dimensional uh, selective filters, that he could actually essentially blank out spec parts of the spectra that are shown here as here an example. Uh, that you could basically selectively excite and invert the signals that you're not interested in, and then they could be removed together with some additional post-acquisition uh, uh, processing. So you could go from a spectra with an artifact signal where you could effectively remove that signal in the two-dimensional spectra and then use the, the remaining signals robustly for fingerprinting. Um, so since uh, these are small, typically small molecule excipients, there were other ways to, to potentially remove them. You can remove them based on the size difference between the large protein and the small molecule. These are typically done, were done with filtering, with diffusion. Small molecules move faster than big molecules and other types of filters. What's important with the Sierra filter is not only does it work very effectively, but because it's really a selective, um, a selection-based removal filter and, and not based on, on diffusion or um, or relaxation is that we actually retain almost 100% of the signal to noise in the spectra. So the filters often come at a price, as you can see at the bottom, the signal to noise goes down at a factor four in some of the uh, pulse field gradient experiments. So again, as I mentioned early on, we're doing these experiments at natural abundance. So we're constantly fighting uh, signal to noise in the NMR to keep that signal to noise as high as possible. So it really is, this filter really, uh, again, other filters could potentially achieve the same goals, but this filter actually can do it in a way with short, um, short uh, time frames for the filter, such that you don't lose the signal to noise in, in removing your signal. For, you don't lose the signal to noise for the rest of the protein signal. And so the last thing to point out is that the, by the nature of the way this, this filter works, uh, you can remove multiple selective regions of the spectra that may be artifactual regions that's shown in gray here simultaneously with the filter all at once. So, so with the Sierra filter, we really can apply these 2D methods to the as-provided uh, uh, pharmaceuticals. And, and we've shown many times over the years now that, that we can robustly collect these spectra at natural abundance and select the signals of interest and remove the signals that are that are interfering. So the question, of course, then comes uh, the application of NMR methods. Can we detect 
and quantify assign any structural variation from our spectra. Um, this is always a question: how you know how senses will the NMR be, and and really somewhat philosophical questions of what does it mean to quantify structure. Um, uh, so, uh, which is essentially how analytical chemists think, but typically structural biologists do not. So, uh, in order to sort of test the NMR method, um, we 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 have again a you know our test molecule NISMAB. And one way to look at structural variation is to sort of do what's called glycan remodeling. So the FC portion of every monoclonal antibody has a single glycan site, N-linked glycan, and there are enzymes that will allow you to trim back that glycan position, and, and then you can look at the response. Um, there's a, a large uh, interest and in many studies that have been done uh, looking at the glycans of FC because of their role in the function of FC. For our purposes, we just remodel them to look at their structural impact. The other uh, example I will point out uh, to show you how NMR could be sensitive is to look at oxidation. Oxidation is uh, something that's of concern in the development of, of an antibody and all biologic drugs as a potential in the, in the manufacturing, uh, packaging, delivery that, that uh, the drugs can oxidize, particularly the thionines. And this could have uh, potential effects on stability, activity, and aggregation. So uh, again, for the glycan case study, what we could do is we could take our NISMAB uh, using exoglycosidases. Uh, we could cleave the MAB off and show them by mass spec that we removed it uh, or trimmed it back. So we changed, again, this shows the mass spec pattern where we changed the pattern of the, of the glycans. These are complex glycans that are on these. So in the first example, we basically just uh, trimmed back the, the, uh, the terminal sugar. Uh, and in the second case, we kind of hit the protein or hit the antibody with a sledgehammer and, and remove the entire glycan and, and basically change the charge at that position. So in one case, we have a fairly subtle change to the glycans, the other a fairly significant change at that position. Um, so we can then look at our spectra and compare the two and um, what you can see, hopefully, is that in the case where there's a significant structural change visually on the left, you can see the difference between the blue and the red spectra. Uh, it's fairly obvious that these spectra are different. But for the spectra where, or the samples where we just trim the glycans back, it's actually, um, it's not obvious to the eye which whether these spectra are the same or different. And on the right, I show you some of the initial uh, um, work that was done to analyze these types of spectra beyond visualization, which was linear correlation. And again, even using this type of an approach, uh, you, you can only really discern with confidence when there's a significant structural difference, which you could already see visually at the top. But if there's a small, subtle change, potentially, uh, this was not uh, able to be de detected using these linear correlation analysis. And um, we can, I won't go into it, but these methods are, uh, the, the correlation methods like this are much more sensitive to signal to noise. You need very high signal to noise to be confident that you're seeing a difference. So, um, so we basically moved away from those types of analysis, comparative analysis of the spectra to use PCA analysis of the spectra. So using principal component analysis, again, you can distill those two dimensional, uh, in, and I'll show you even one dimensional spectra down into uh, principal components. If we uh, then look at the, the differences as a function of these so-called principal components, one, two, and three, that shows you sort of the difference, what's differentiating the spectra uh, that have been sort of distilled down into these single points uh, on this uh, n-dimensional space. And so what you can see here from a plot of, of the principal components of PC1 and PC2 for our glycan example is that if you look at the native sample, you get a you know, cluster in here, the deglycosylated, which removed the entire glycan up the grouping up here, and then the samples where you had just trimmed glycans, uh, we could cluster, we see clustering here. So the, the PCA actually provides a very robust and easy way to, to readily separate even the spectra where visually we couldn't tell the difference uh, visually and by linear correlation. Um, the other nice feature of the PCA analysis is we could go back and using PCA loading pots, which is basically sort of um, plotting the PCA component back as a two-dimensional spectral representation. We could see 
the aspects of the two-dimensional spectra that actually was contributing to the difference. So again, you can plot the PC, uh, uh, make the PC plots, look for clustering, and then look for the principal components uh, and overlay them back on your original spectra here are shown in, in basically red and blue. And those sort of peaks show you what aspects of that two-dimensional spectra are contributing to the to the differences that are seen in the principal component that, that are distinguishing the spectra. And so you can look in your spectra and try to understand where the differences are coming from. So it's, it's something that could be used uh, either in just sort of a default mode where you uh, look for the differences, but you can also then uh, look at that PCA loading plot and see where the differences are coming on your spectra. So uh, we almost do all of our analysis now uh, by PCA. Uh, it's an excellent way to look at many spectra. We're not, you know, this is not the first application. There's many, many applications of principal component analysis for NMR and other sort of techniques. Um, the nice, some of the nice features is that certainly it can be applied even when the visual inspection is not possible. It also points out that in, in many, uh, what we're also trying to achieve here is we want to take the method such that a non-expert could use it, and you don't need expertise to look directly at spectra, because typically an expert NMR, uh, an NMR expert could look at a spectra and see things, um, but we want to bring it more broadly to, to users who may not be experts. Um, the PCA loading plots really tell you, uh, can tell you where this, this spectra are coming from. Um, we use the total points of the of the spectra, so there's importance in alignment and scaling. So there's certain things you have to do. You have to match many things. It's very sensitive to differences, um, but it's it's basically one of the good features is that it really is robust. And I'll point that out in another example to random noise and and the resolution of the input. So um, you need good measurement technique, but you can tolerate pretty high, um, pretty low signal to noise, which again in the NMR world where where the signal to noise is always an issue, uh, particularly when you're collecting spectra natural abundance or you want to do spectral uh, measurements quickly, that's really important. And I'll point out an example that Frank DeLaglia, who's really leading all the spectral processing in our group, uh, has developed where we can actually even use PCA in a quantitative um, mode to, add, you know, to sort of start to address this question, can we quantify a structural difference between two different proteins? Um, so the, the second example I wanted to just point out uh, quickly is looking at oxidation, and this is work that, that Sega Solomon, who uh, was a postdoc in the group who recently left us for GSK, uh, she led a study where we looked at tracking, uh, together with Rob Brinson, who was our mentor, the, um, the oxidation of the NISMAP over a time course. And so what's shown here on this first slide is it's very easy, for example, to see when you oxidize methionine, as shown in the box, you get the methyl sulfoxide. And chemistry is very easy to pick up. Oftentimes in NMR, you see the, shit, the peaks as the chemistry or the modifications of the methionines happen. They shift to a new position in the spectra. But really, what's, what was most interesting to us is to look at the impact of that oxidation over time on other parts of the NMR spectra, the, the, the structural consequences besides the chemical change to the particular amino acid. And so, um, again, using PCA analysis, uh, different point, time points were able to be multiple uh, acquisitions were taken at each time point. These could be clustered and then plotted to look at the sort of variance in the in the NIST map as a function of time, how the structure was changing and plotted in, according to the PCA, uh, the PCA score, particularly the PCA2 score. And again, at each time point, one could use loading pots to look where to see where the variance is coming from. And again, I didn't point this out on the glycan spectra, but um, Things like removal of the glycans or uh, oxidation of the methionines, these signals are moving. These are sort of easily coming to, to pop up and seeing contributing to the differences. But there are also these other positions or signals in the NIST map that are changing, which are uh, indirectly and more related to structure and not directly to that chemical modification. And, the, and so the interesting thing uh, that, that Sega did is um, we also get this question of correlating um, a chemical change or a, a primary amino acid change with a structural change and that implication of that structural change for stability of the molecule or for uh, 
function of the molecule. So at every time point, uh, SEGA also collected binding data, looking at binding of the NISMAB to protein A and F protein. These are small proteins that bind to, to all ant monoclonal antibodies, and then looked at the intrinsic tryptophan fluorescent melting profile and looked at how the, the stability of the protein was changing. Uh, these were all fairly well understood that as you oxidize the, the, the MAB, you would uh, basically decrease its stability and also change its, its ability to function and to bind uh, normally its uh, protein binding partners. Um, what I found really quite interesting uh, is when you look at the NMR, so here's what we, what's shown here is if you look at the things like affinity for, for binding affinity for these proteins or peptides, the protein A, and you come and you plot them as a function, uh, as a function of change in the PCA2 score, there's a fairly good linear correlation between the structural changes that are detected by the NMR as read out in a PCA score and the change in, in, in basically ability to bind at high affinity, these binding partners. And the same thing is true with stability. If we look at the changes in the stability of the NISMAB as a function of changes in the higher order structure as read out by the NMR spectra processed through the PCA, again, and plot the PCA uh, difference as a, function, uh, as a function of stability change, again, you see a fairly uh, good correlate, linear correlation. So as one might expect, the, and this sort of data has sort of borne out, when you have a chemical change like oxidation that manifests in structural changes to the protein, the structural changes should correlate um, often with, with diminished, uh, you know, could correlate with diminished stability and also diminished binding affinity because the structures are changing. It's the, the oxidation in this case, the stabilizing structure and also changing its binding interaction. So it really put the NMR in between the, uh, to, to show where, how these sort of structural measurements could be directly correlated. And that, that question comes up quite often. How, how do these structural changes we see by NMR correlate with function, efficacy, and stability? And so that this study, which just was published in the last um, few weeks, I think, or a month or so, uh, I basically, is starting, and, uh, and others are showing the same, other groups are starting to show this, how you can correlate the structural data with, with uh, function and, and stability. Um, so again, as I already alluded to, um, we want to ask the question, can we look at two spectra uh, and say, are they the same? And go beyond to saying same different. Can we, can we say something about how similar something is structurally? And so um, to do this, um, Frank uh, Delagli and the group uh, basically has uh, shown that if in this uh, particular case where you're comparing two sample classes, so if you use the PCA to look at um, two different um, molecules, uh, the replicate measurements within the two classes can be used to show to show uh, a distribution, uh, a numerical distribution around the, the PCA score. So the PCA, can be used to cluster, and then by using the PCA, any variance that in a in a repeatable replicate set between two sets of two sets of samples, anything beyond the second principal component represents sort of a variation in that class. So what that means is you can take um, the PCA, which we've already seen many times. Uh, it can be used to cluster two different types of uh, you know protein, you know two say NISMAB with oxidation or not oxidation. Um, these can be converted from a PCA score into a numerical score. And then the, in terms of the uh, distance and, and standard deviations around those scores can be used to create Gaussian surfaces. And so you essentially get a Gaussian surface around each uh, of the PCA clusters, a numerical uh, Gaussian distribution. And then by having that sort of you know conversion from PCA to Z scores, and then the, and then establishing this this Gaussian surface, which represents the cluster, uh, one could then um, look at the distances between these two clusters and get begin to get a quantitative measure uh, by the distances between the two clusters of how close or similar they are. So again, you use the structural variation within a class 
uh, through replicate measurements and then convert that numerically to allow a distance measurement between the two classes. Uh, and so one could imagine a scenario where in a pharma company, you have a reference um, molecule, which is well established with its uh, uh, and, and is used for comparison to new lots or, or biosimilars. So it's again, this two class comparison and you can sort of say how well does each lot, new lot compare to the reference uh, material or how well does the biosimilar compare to the new uh, material quantitatively? Okay, so that's the same, basically showing the same thing I did. You can get the minimal interclass distance to get you sort of begin to understand or to, to describe the differences in a quantitative way between the two structures. Okay, so um, getting towards the end of the talk, but I wanted to point out uh, that NMR is a multifaceted, multimodal tool. There's a lot of ways it can be applied. We've been sort of focusing a lot on two-dimensional correlation. Uh, there's a lot of information there that can be acquired in a relatively rapid time frame, um, and is shown to be very robust for, for fingerprinting. But there's also a role for, for one-dimensional NMR, which is not as highly resolved, but has the potential to be applied uh, much more rapidly at higher sensitivity, particularly if you're doing proton correlated uh, proton spectra. So um, at the same time that we were really sort of working to sort of advance the two dimensional methods, a uh, group at Amgen uh, was uh, also uh, pursuing and developing the application of one dimensional proton spectra applied to monoclonal antibodies in a method they called profile. Um, just to briefly summarize what profile does, typically the challenge with a one-dimensional NMR spectra, as you can see all the way on the left here, is there's a lot of signals. The antibody, again, is uh, somewhat broad, and it really is uh, difficult to, to pull out any specific signals from this. And with all the overlap, uh, it really doesn't have the resolving power of the two-dimensional spectra. What uh, the group at Amgen did was uh, use a processing method to, to basically uh, remove the broad underlying uh, spectra from the one-dimensional spectra using a, a manipulation of subtracting a Gaussian broadened contour spectra that's shown in the middle. And then they that the subtraction of these two spectra generated the so-called fingerprint spectra, which represents the fine structure of the one-dimensional spectra. And the patterns of those were shown to be again, correlated with the NMR, uh, with the structure. Um, so what a, uh, a postdoc came to our group. So we, we actually um, decided or uh, I think worked, uh, contacted the group at Amgen and said we would, you know, like to collaborate to look at the, um, the application of one and two dimensional NMR, look for fit for purpose. Again, that's something we always worry, you know, think about is where should the method be applied and and at what level of resolution do you need? You know, again, using things in, in time frames that, that are best suited for the application. And so we wanted to explore the, the one and two dimensional methods and see where they worked best. And in the course of this collaboration and, and a joint, this was with Matt Wilstrom uh, and a postdoc, Wade Elliott, who's, above Luke in this picture, Wade, who, who came to us to work with us with Amgen, um, and again with Luke Arbogast, uh, it was sort of uh, appreciated that one could actually use, again, the PCA approach to get an analogous type of way to, to sort of pull out the fine and the fine differences in the spectra without doing it in a sort of an alternative way to the post-processing contour subtraction to generate the fingerprint as was done with profile. And this uh, so-called PCA approach to one-dimensional uh, uh, MAP spectra was dubbed profound, so uh, protein fingerprinting using the polity composition. But essentially, if you look at it analogously, uh, the first principal component, again, the average of the spectra looks very much like the monochrome antibody uh, broadened spectra here uh, in B, and then the second principal component actually represents the, the differences, the finer structure, which is again, it's a different uh, analysis, but somewhat analogous to the fingerprint. And basically the, eval the, the value of using the profound method is that there's no subtraction. So it's, a, it's an easier approach for analysis. And it's much more, as I'll show you, robust in terms of uh, signal to noise that can be uh, handled 
whoops, excuse me. Um, so by using the, again, the one dimensional proton spectra and applying the PCA component, uh, they can, uh, Wade and Luke were able to show that you could apply this sort of cluster uh, analysis to one dimensional spectra down to very low signals to noise, which again is the value uh, of the one dimensional spectra. The profile spectra oftentimes would take many, many, many scans, which could take you know hours to collect. So you to get the, the signal to noise, one would need to do the post uh, acquisition processing here. The using the PCA approach to the direct one dimensional pulse field grade, uh, field gradient stimulated 1D spectra, we could directly pull the data into PCA. Low signal to noise uh, was tolerated again. And um, again, using the profound results, uh, the, we have reference data on the left, which shows the thousand scans, which is something that would be typically taken for profile but we could get the same robust clustering of the different antibodies uh, using microprobes, smaller number of scans, and even lower field NMR. So uh, one could imagine taking this, uh, pushing this all the way down to benchtop NMRs with very low field, low resolution spectrum that should potentially still have the discern discerning power to distinguish between these different antibodies. So the 1D, again, in this context, using the PCA, gives you all of the advantages of the one-dimensional spectra. It's highly sensitive, it's rapid. Uh, it can give you these yes, no answers. Is it the same, is it clustering? Um, certainly one could, uh, could then move to two-dimensional spectra if one is interested in, in the more details of the structure of the, of the molecule. And there were also, it turned out, due to the nature of the methods, there was uh, some degree of complementarity between the different aspects of structural variants that one could pick up with 1D versus 2D chemical changes versus things like um, the diffusion changes. So, uh, so, so everything I've spoke to you so far about is using the NMR fingerprinting or NMR as a fingerprinting tool and really being agnostic agnostic to the to the what the where the signals actually come from. We're just looking for patterns and matching patterns. And if patterns match or don't match, you can say to what degree the structures are the same or different or highly similar or not. And that serves a very useful function. But as NMR spectroscopists, we know that, or we always want to be able to put labels on those peaks. And so if you could put labels on those peaks, not only could you do the patterning sort of recognition and comparability, but you could also start to think about well, if there is a structural change, and this is another question that comes up often is, well, what's the action if there's a change in your NMR spectra? You know, what's the functional, of course, and stability outcomes, how does it correlate? And then could you basically, if you could assign that structural change to its particular amino acid or structural element in the protein, that would be highly valuable. So uh, coming back to what I pointed out in an earlier slide in the talk, the fab, uh, the um, excuse me, the MAB molecule is essentially um, three domains: the FC and two FABs connected by a flexible linker. So the two fabs are in blue, the flexible linker in green, and the FC uh, uh, is is in uh, is in orange here. And if you look, you know, it may be hard to pick this up over the over the Zoom call, but essentially the FC FAB spectra are fairly closely resembling the summation of those two spectra, the intact antibody. And that's something that one might expect if you have flexible domains that are really interacting with each other. So the value of this observation is one could potentially uh, express these fragment molecules, assign them, and then transpose those assignments onto the full intact map. And the reason that's important, and I'm not gonna go into any of that detail, but it, we've spent years in the group uh, trying to establish uh, platforms for the expression isotope enrichment of monoclonal antibodies and their fragments. And just to say monoclonal antibodies are produced in typically in CHO cells or mammalian systems. And for those who are not familiar with, with mammalian cell culture, uh, growing things, particularly on DTO, is really not possible. And, and deuteration is really critical to get assignments at this size of a protein. So uh, without going through all the, the uh, 
attempts to do things with E. coli. Uh, I would just jump right into where things have worked recently. And this is, again, the work of Kinlan in our group and Brad, who are on the left, uh, who are our yeast uh, protein expression experts, and then uh, work by Sega, who I already mentioned, who worked on this uh, oxidation work, and Rob Brinson. Uh, uh, Kinlan and Brad were able to take a uh, expression system that was initially developed in the group in Health Canada and optimized, pro which was used early on in that um, interlab study I mentioned as a uh, suitability sample, and they were able to optimize the protocols to allow triple labeling of uh, uh, deuterium, carbon, and nitrogen uh, with the ability to triply label the protein uh, dealing with some other tricks about reprotonating the amides, which we which had to be done because it turns out the back exchange didn't happen completely in such a large stable fragment as the fab. They were able, as I can show you here, is to assign these labels, which again represent the backbone amide assignments. So for those who are not familiar with NMR assignment, with the ability to, to label the protein, one can actually jump from uh, atom to atom, from proton to carbon to nitrogen. And by creating these patterns of, of relays of, of correlations, one can line them up and get essentially sequential assignment through the whole protein backbone. And by doing this, they've reached a, a confident assignment of almost 95% of the molecule. And now uh, this opens up the possibility to overlay these uh, assignments on the, for example, in this case, we focus first on the fab onto the intact antibody and look for spectral responses of the antibody and assign them uh, to specific structural regions. And the, the idea here from a, from a pharmaceutical perspective is again, as a platform uh, molecule, um, we would hope that going through the assignment exercise once should be sufficient to transpose these assignments onto the, the platform molecule and represent uh, since these platform maps have very few amino acids that are changed as they are retargeted to different indications, a lot of the initial work in development of an antibody uh, to do these assignments, first of all, for a particular antibody, once the assignments are done, they do not have to be typically repeated. And so you basically have this information throughout the life cycle of the drug and potentially transported to different um, drug development campaigns, again, within a company using highly sequenced similar amino acid uh, antibodies. So uh, with that, I'll just summarize uh, what I said today. So hopefully I've given you a pretty broad overview of how one and two dimensional NMR uh, methods can be used to fingerprint MAVs. Uh, we just point out that when we started this work, there wasn't a lot of confidence. There's still some, some skepticism, particularly in the industry about you know, how well NMR would work for such large proteins as monoclonal antibodies, um, you know, and, and how it could be uh, sort of woven into their sort of development, quality control, manufacturing of these types of pharmaceuticals. But I think, you know, we've come a long way to show how these methods are robust in general. The two, one and two D methods, as I said, uh, through our work with Amgen are quite complementary. They are somewhat sensitive to different aspects of the molecule. And again, the power of NMR is you can look at mixtures of samples and using selective pulsing, we can actually filter suppress signals we want or pull out signals we don't want. And again, this allows us, all of these approaches are driven towards the idea of applying these methods to the pharmaceutical uh, that's coming out of the syringe or the vial without making any changes to the formulation of that drug or requiring any tagging or labeling. And uh, I sort of gave some um, overview of the spectral processing that's involved here and the idea of basically taking the method out of the hands of the experts to create sort of abilities for non-experts to use it, to answer simple yes, no questions, does it in spec or out of spec, how to actually start to think about quantifying structural differences, uh, which as I said, is not typically how we think. And again, the last part, which we which we've been very excited about in the last year or so um, to really put assignments on these spectra to start to ask even more detailed questions to try to help again um, guide understanding structural changes which could help improve and develop new antibodies. And I've sort of 
alluded to folks as I've gone through the talk, but this again is a summary to thank everybody who's been involved in the group, Rob and Frank in particular. I think they're on the call today. Luke, who was with us for many years, who recently moved to Eli Lilly, a number of very talented postdocs, um, all of whom have left us for industry in the last year or so. And again, our longstanding collaborations with uh, Eva Bon and, and his group in Health Canada. And I didn't talk about it, but we really uh, have started in the last year or so um, to get more involved with Bruce Yu, who is a University of Maryland faculty member here at IVBR, and in the application of benchtop NMR. So and as you can see from this picture here at IVBR and NIST, we, we want to go from 900 megahertz all the way down to a benchtop system to show NMR as sort of uh, applications and fit for purpose in different, in different aspects to be practical. All right. Um, so that, that's what I have for you today. I would be happy to take questions. Kind of went right up to the last minute.